Dartford has a long history of religious, industrial and cultural importance, from Stone Age through Steam Age to Smartphone Age. There's an artwork on the wall of One Bell Corner in Dartford Town today, which sums up the many achievements of Dartford as the engineering town that changed the world. We will start at the beginning. There have been at least five major ice ages, with tropical phases in between. The climate was turbulent. The geology of Dartford was created mainly by seas and rivers. Later, bears, mammoths and lions roamed the land and ate tropical plants and each other. Swanson Man and his settlements were part of this time. A skull along with flint tools have been found in recent times. 4,000 years ago we had bronze tools and later iron tools. Engineering development was slow in Dartford but found itself in the front line of the Roman conquest. For 400 years Dartford was influenced by Roman religion, culture, language and technology. 1,600 years ago the Romans had gone and there followed a time of turmoil and unrest. In medieval times Tarrant Fort was a small but thriving agricultural community of 150 families. The manor of Dartford comprised a mixture of arable land, meadows, pastures and woodland. Holy Trinity Church and three small chapels, a mill and two wharfs, existed as the centre of the community. Oxen were used to plough the land and pigs foraged in the local woods. Dartford had evolved into a thriving and successful medieval market town and become the centre of a network of smaller agricultural communities scattered along the fertile Darrant Valley and the south bank of the River Thames. Durante Ford was a crossing point, a recognised settlement on the London to Kent Roman Road, Watling Street, and gets its name from the Ford over the River Darrant. In 1540, the dissolution of Dartford Priory was part of Henry VIII's quarrel with the church. He later built one of his royal manor houses in Dartford. The gatehouse of Henry VIII's royal manor house was part of a complex which had the usual outbuildings and large gardens. The 12 acre land was bordered by high stone walls. 1680 onwards, the local gentry established a strong position for themselves in local politics as philanthropists and benefactors. The quality of life for everyone improved considerably, however society was divided into three main groups, the rich, the middle classes and the poor. Dartford's geographical position and natural resources attracted a number of leading entrepreneur industrialists. Dartford has been the centre of some notable engineering triumphs, from steam to aircraft, drugs to cement and changing entertainment forever. In 1587, Martin Frobisher's smelting works, Sir John Spillman's paper mill, Godfrey Box's iron slitting mill and many others created a mini industrial revolution. From this point our engineering view of Dartford starts. Let us run through the timeline. In 1588 John Spillman granted a crown lease of two mills in the manor of Bignors at Dartford, probably close to what is now Powder Mill Lane, located on the River Down. The mills appeared to have been owned by Spillman and he may have been the financier. He undertook expensive repairs and when everybody else was producing brown paper he had a patent which enabled him to be the first mill in England to produce good quality white paper on a commercial scale. In 1595, Godfrey Box was a 16th century entrepreneur, an immigrant from the Low Countries. He built England's first iron splitting mill on the River Down at Dartford Creek. In 1785, John Hall started his engineering works in Lowfield Street, Dartford. Within six years, John Hall needed larger premises and found them in Waterside, now Hyde Street, on land which had once formed part of the Dartford Priory. In 1806, Brian Donkin, an ex-Hall's apprentice, revolutionised the world's paper industry. He played a leading role in the invention of a paper making machine which could produce continuous rolls of paper. He also had a major part in establishing the world's first food canning factory. Richard Trevithick was born in Cornwall in 1771. Steam power at this time was in its infancy. He was intrigued to watch the primitive pumping machines keeping the Cornish tin mines free from water. The young Richard managed to secure an apprenticeship, soon qualified as an engineer and invented new types of pumping engines for the mines and experimented with high pressure steam. In 1801 he road tested the Camborne Road locomotive, the first full size locomotive to be built in Britain. The second locomotive was built in 1803. It was tested in Cornwall and then sent to London where it ran daily at a great speed of 8 miles an hour. One of Trevithick's most important achievements was the Penny Darwin. In 1804 it was the first ever railway locomotive. In 1808 Trevithick constructed at his own cost a 12 mile an hour locomotive and circular railway track on a parcel of land to the south of Euston Square in London. Trevithick was a prolific inventor. Inventions included a string dredger, steam propulsion for ships, iron floating docks, 
the screw propeller, agricultural steam engines, pumping engines, hot air heaters, a method of making ice, a scheme for draining the Dutch polders. From 1817 to 1822 Richard worked in Peru and Costa Rica, but returned penniless to England. In 1815, Augustus Applegath had many papers to do with printing on paper and silk. He had a factory in Dartford for printing silk, but was known for double-sided printing, including the Times. He printed multicolour banknotes to meet the needs for being forgery-proof, but was rejected by the Bank of England. In 1824, William Aspin held origins of Portland cement. Although known about since Egyptian and Roman times, the development was to take place near Dartford in the general area which now includes one of the excavations at Blue Water Shopping Centre. 1824, John Marshall had a paper mill on the banks of the River Darren, just below Holy Trinity Church. His device put a continuous high quality watermark into paper. It had only been possible in single sheets up until this time. Bank of England appointed Marshall to manufacture the moulds for the English banknotes. In 1832, Richard Trevithick was invited to Dartford by John Hall to carry out some experiments associated with the engine of a vessel lately built. It is generally supposed that Trevithick was engaged with the development of a reaction turbine. The experimental work conducted here cost Mr Hall £1,200, which was probably based at Dartford Hall's engineering works for about a year, during which time he lived at the Bull Hotel. Trevithick died penniless with no relatives by his side. The mechanics from Hall's works acted as bearers at his funeral. They paid the fees for the burial and for a watchman as body snatching was prevalent. In 1886, Everard Hethkiss was a pioneer in refrigeration who bought J and E Halls back from the brink of collapse. Dartford had several achievements with the early days of flight. In 1894, Hiram Maxim made a short flight in an 18-foot diameter propeller-driven flying machine powered by steam, weighing 8,000 pounds. It flew for 100 feet and earned its place in the Guinness Book of Records. The location of this rented house, office and workshop was Baldwin's Park, and the flight took place across the fields of what is now a sports club. He also invented a machine gun, which could fire 660 rounds per minute. In 1910, Vickers decided to continue the work of Maxim on the site adjacent to Joyce Green Hospital. The number one monoplane test flight in 1911 used Duralumin. The design evolved into a biplane which housed guns for the military and had the propeller at the rear. During the First World War, many further developments were made. During 1919, Captain Jack Hawcock and Lieutenant Arthur Whitten Brown made the world's first non-stop transoceanic flight in a Vickers Vimy. Later, Ross and Keith Smith flew a Vimy all the way to Australia, thus highlighting the possibilities of scheduled flights to far off lands. In 1889, the pharmaceutical company Burroughs Welcome came to Dartford and played a large part in the development of the pharmaceuticals industry. They started with compressed herbal tablets and went on to develop many drugs including insulin and many retroviral drugs. They took their place in history with the development of new medicine and supporting the people of Dartford. Charles Welcome and Jane Hall became major employers for the town and provided many opportunities for their workers. In 1840, Jane Hall had a diverse engineering portfolio and spawned many mechanical engineers. Their work was mainly in refrigeration and escalators and had many notable achievements. Box and Electronic were the modern successors to the heavy engineering era and pioneered some major developments in the audio, video and lighting industries. In 1964, Vox, a Dartford based company, changed music forever. The AC30 valve amplifier with no feedback was loved by all. Not bad for the cooling repair company. Tom Jennings and Dick Denning created Vox, and a phenomenon respected by the Beatles, Rolling Stones, and The Shadows, and just about every other band of the era. Their premises are no longer here. It is a petrol station and car fire, but one of their buildings, next to the hair salon, still exists. Finally, in an attempt to develop the product further, they entered into a bad financial deal and went out of business. Box amplifiers are now made by Korg. In 1968, Electrosonic started in Charlton, and in 1990 made Dartford their international head office. They started making dimmers for lighting. This evolved into slide projector control with the aim of making very large images from multiple projectors. They also developed audio and lighting products. Later, they pioneered video walls and remained a leader in their field for some time. So what's next for engineering? Is there a future or is it a phase which is now past? 
A recent report from CEBR suggests that between 2012 and 2022, the engineering sector will be contributing more than 27% to GDP, and that could lead to more than 250,000 new vacancies. However, there is a projected shortage of skilled engineers, estimated at 25,000 per year. It is not clear why, as engineers can expect to earn at least 15% above other occupations, and it may rise due to the shortage. It's up to us whether we follow our heritage.